Welcome to TSX Quarterly, the podcast that brings you publicly available earnings calls from companies listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange in one convenient location. Gone are the days of looking through confusing websites. You'll find the important information right here. Enjoy the call. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to RBC's conference call for the fourth quarter 2021 financial results. Please be advised that this call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the meeting over to Asim Imran, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, Mr. Imran. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Speaking today will be Dave Mackay, President and Chief Executive Officer, Nadine Ahn, Chief Financial Officer, and Graham Hepworth, Chief Risk Officer. Also joining us today for your questions, Neil McLaughlin, Group Head, Personal and Commercial Banking, Doug Guzman, Group Head, Wealth Management, Insurance, and INTS, and Derek Nellner, Group Head, Capital Markets. As noted on slide one, our comments may contain forward-looking statements, which involve assumptions and have inherent risks and uncertainties. Actual results could differ materially. I would also remind listeners that the bank assesses its performance on a reported and adjusted basis and considers both to be useful in assessing underlying business performance. To give everyone a chance to ask questions, we ask that you limit your questions and then requeue. With that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Awesome, and congratulations on your recent appointment to RBC's Head of Investor Relations. And good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This morning, we reported fourth quarter earnings of $3.9 billion. Our results include further releases of PCL on performing loans, primarily reflecting improvements in our macroeconomic and credit quality outlook. Pre-provision, pre-tax earnings of $4.8 billion were driven by robust client activity, driving fee-based revenue growth in Canadian banking, wealth management, and investment banking. In addition, Canadian banking and City National continue to generate strong volume growth. These factors were partly offset by a moderation in our global markets businesses, the continued impact of low interest rates, and higher expenses, largely due to variable compensation. As we continue to invest in our core businesses and strategies, we're committed to running our bank efficiently and driving improved productivity. Looking back, 2021 was a year that saw RBC stepping up for our clients and communities while supporting our employees. Across our core businesses, we saw robust client activity, and as a result, we delivered record revenue of nearly $50 billion. We earned $16 billion in net income and generated a 19% ROE while paying $6.1 billion in taxes, over $6 billion in dividends, and meeting all of our medium-term objectives. Also noteworthy was our strong double-digit growth in book value per share, highlighting our ability to compound the value of our business while maintaining the quality and risk appetite of the RBC franchise. We ended a strong year with a record CET1 ratio of 13.7%, up 120 basis points, with CT1 capital up $7.5 billion from last year. As we turn our focus to 2022, From a macro perspective, we continue to see a strong recovery with consumer spending almost 20% above 2019 levels, increased mobility in society, and corporate management teams actively pursuing growth opportunities. At the same time, we recognize our significant challenges, including supply demand imbalances, disrupting supply chains, and various parts of the economy, including labor, housing, and energy markets. These factors are driving uncertainty and adding to inflation risk, which we are closely monitoring. While higher interest rates could add some drag to economic growth, we do not see material credit concerns given excess client liquidity, strong underwriting, including testing for higher rates. As the Dean will speak to later, we are well positioned to benefit from rising interest rates given our leading Canadian deposit franchise and the asset sensitive nature of U.S. wealth management's balance sheet. To highlight the potential benefit over time, the impact of lower interest rates reduced our revenue by approximately $1 billion in each of the last two years, the majority 
in Canadian banking and U.S. wealth management, including City National. Additionally, we are poised to benefit from the deployment of unprecedented buildup of liquidity that we expect Canadians will use for a better tomorrow, whether that is to buy a home, increase discretionary spending, or invest in financial markets. Within this context, let me expand how our momentum and ability to create value for clients along with our premium franchises, position RBC to succeed heading into 2022 and beyond. Our strong balance sheet gives us flexibility to continue supporting our growth momentum and strategic initiatives, in addition to driving increasing shareholder returns. And this morning we announced a 12 cent or 11% increase in our quarterly dividend, while also announcing our intention to repurchase, repurchase up to 45 million common shares under a normal course issuer bid. We remain focused on driving premium organic growth, including expanding our market leading position in Canada. We see growth opportunities in each of our Canadian businesses and our results this year reflect the value we create for our clients. In Canadian banking, we added over $35 billion in mortgages and over $22 billion in personal deposits over the last year, leading to market share gains in both these anchor products. We have added and continue to add to our 1,750 plus mortgage specialist sales force. We also continue to invest in digital tools and capabilities to enhance the client experience and the productivity of our sales team. Looking forward, we expect mortgage growth to be strong in a high single digit range, supported by low interest rates, supply demand imbalances affecting prices and increasing immigration activity. We are seeing a strong recovery in transactional purchase activity, which helped drive a sequential increase in credit card balances, including revolvers. And though commercial utilization rates remain well below pre-pandemic levels, we are seeing an uptick, which is helping drive the emergence of stronger commercial lending activity. We are also hiring commercial account managers in priority industries, including in RBCX, where we provide capital advice to the growing innovation ecosystem. And as we move up the value chain and continue to reimagine banking and innovation, we are well positioned for a world of payment modernization and open banking. RBC Ventures remains core to accelerating our growth by creating value beyond banking, including in our healthcare and youth ecosystems. We are excited about Dr. Bill, a venture which helps reduce the complexity of medical billing for physicians. We are currently serving nearly 3,000 Canadian physicians, up 28%, from last year. Also within the healthcare vertical, we continue to support Canada's medical community with our exclusive multi-year strategic partnership with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. In the youth segment, MIDO is a new pillar that helps kids learn and practice money management. We recently hit a milestone having onboarded 10,000 Canadian households. Over the last two years, we have added 350,000 net new Canadian banking clients, including over 200,000 this year alone. In a period when clients weren't making as many decisions to switch banks, and immigration activity was muted. Given the value added initiatives we put in place, we are well positioned to continue attracting even more clients, an important area of focus. Almost 70% of our Canadian banking clients who have a core checking account and or mortgage with us also have a card and investment relationship. And clients with mortgage and checking accounts that were onboarded three years ago in 2018 have deepened their relationship to all four products at a rate that is three times greater than any other acquisition relationship. This leads to another core part of our Canadian strategy which is to deepen our client relationships including providing access to best-in-class award-winning service and advice, which has defined our leadership in wealth and asset management. As I noted earlier, we expect much of the buildup of liquidity in the system will be used to increase discretionary spending or be invested. And our full set of integrated end-to-end -end industry leading wealth and asset management solutions have well over $1 trillion in client assets. These cover the full spectrum of client segments and needs, ranging from digital only solutions up to full-service discretionary wealth management. Following a record year last year, RBC Direct Investing, 
finished 2021 with another year of exceptional growth, including record trading volumes and record new client acquisition, with nearly half of new clients added this year being under the age of 35. And Investees has, been, has seen account openings double from the last year. In the wealth advisory space, our leading scale has complemented, is complemented by our differentiated technology and investment expertise, including private banking, insurance, estate, philanthropy, and business planning solutions. These factors drive strong advisor productivity, with RBC Dominion Securities ranked number one amongst bank-owned advisory firms in 2021 Investment Executive Brokerage Report Card. And my advisor, our digital platform to review financial plans, now has nearly 3 million clients. Overall, our wealth management businesses continue to see strong growth in client assets. On a year-over-year -year basis, Canadian Banking and Wealth Management Canada, AUA, increased 26% each. With RBC Global Asset Management, we have a leading North American asset manager at scale, with 85% of AUM outperforming the benchmark over the last three years at below average fees. It's a testament to the strength of the platform. RBC Global Asset Management was recognized for its outstanding investment performance at the 2021 Canada Lipper Fund Awards. RBC GAM AUM was up 15% year over year. While higher markets were a large contributor, we also saw record Canadian long-term retail net sales of over $20 billion, or 17% of all industry-wide flows, adding to its leading market share in industry AUM. And though we can't control where equity markets will go, we are well positioned to add to our market share in industry net flows, as clients can choose from a broad range of products and advisory services, which increasingly include an ESG and alternatives product suite. Our scale, innovation, and an ability to deepen client relationships with leading value propositions underpin our 30% ROE across our banking, wealth, and asset management platforms in Canada. Turning to the U.S., I want to focus on our diversified growth strategy. Our client franchises across wealth management, private, and commercial banking, and capital markets generated $10, billion, $10 U.S. billion, or 25% of total revenue over the last 12 months. Our U.S. capital markets franchise, our largest U.S. business, had yet another great quarter as we reported strong investment banking revenue on higher M&A advisory and loan syndication activity. We are increasingly deepening relationships and winning significant M&A advisory mandates with important partners such as Blackstone. Earlier this year, RBC Capital Markets acted as exclusive financial advisor to Blackstone on the acquisition of Aleutian, a leading education technology solutions provider. This followed being the advisor on their acquisition of Signature Aviation. Looking forward, our investment banking pipeline remains strong benefiting from the strength of our franchise. Our goal is to be a top 10 global investment bank while maintaining our position as a clear leader in Canada. And with this in mind, we have added a number of managing directors in U.S. investment banking, especially in technology and healthcare sectors, while also focusing on sustainable finance, a growth opportunity for us and our clients. City National continues to be a growth company with wholesale loans up a further 3% over last year, or up 11% excluding triple P trends. Our mid-market strategy, along with the expansion of market coverage, is expected to add to our growth trajectory. Mortgages at City National were up 23% year over year as we continue to grow our high net worth private banking capabilities with a mortgage-led growth strategy. And deposit growth was up a strong 25% this year. Going forward, we continue to expect strong loan growth in our city national businesses. And in U.S. wealth management, we grew client assets 30% year over year to nearly 570 billion U.S. dollars, including the addition of high quality advisors to our private client group platform. We are increasingly adding lending products to provide holistic advice to our U.S. wealth clients. 
our securities-based lending portfolio has increased by over $2 billion, or nearly 60% year-over-year. Beyond our underlying business performance in 2021, we recognize we have an important role to play in accelerating clean economic growth. A key pillar of our enterprise strategy is to play a leadership role in the transition of our economy to net zero emissions, including helping clients work through an orderly energy transition. As part of that, we are committed to providing $500 billion in sustainable finance by 2025. And in addition to our own net zero commitments, we are pleased to have joined the Net Zero Banking Alliance. To sum up, we are entering 2022 with strong momentum and are well positioned to take advantage of secular and macro trends and deliver client and shareholder value over the near and long term. Our focus will be to drive growth while maintaining prudent risk management and expense discipline. We will continue to leverage the size and strength of our balance sheet to consolidate our broad-based leadership position in Canada, including deepening client relationships and investing for the innovation economy. And in the U.S., we will continue to execute on our multi-pronged growth strategy across capital markets, city national, and wealth management. Before I conclude, I want to thank our more than 87,000 colleagues for their relentless dedication in living our purpose through these extraordinary times. And now I will pass it to Nadine An, our new CFO, who is well known to the investment community from her time as Head of Investor Relations and CFO of RBC Capital Markets previously. Nadine brings a wealth of experience gained over 20 years at RBC, including a number of positions of increasing responsibility in our corporate treasury group. And Nadine, over to you. Thank you, Dave, and good morning, everyone. I will start on slide 11. We reported quarterly earnings of $3.9 billion, up 20% from last year, including the benefit of a $355 million release of TCL on performing loans. Earnings per share of $2.68 was also up 20%. Pre-provision pre-tax earnings of $4.8 billion were up 4% year over year, including the impact of a legal provision at City National. Before I expand on earnings drivers, I will speak to capital on slide 12. Our CT1 ratio was up 10 basis points sequentially to a strong 13.7%. Our strong earnings net of dividends added 42 basis points to our CT1 ratio, highlighting the capital generation power of our diversified business model and premium ROE. Robust client-driven business growth across our largest segments was partly offset by $2 billion of net credit migration. Looking forward, we will continue to take a disciplined approach to deploying capital to create long-term value for our shareholders. We will lead with client-driven organic RWA growth and look to revert back to our traditional policy of twice a year dividend increases, returning to the midpoint of our 40 to 50% dividend payout ratio objective. This morning, we also announced a normal course issuer bid, which will allow us to repurchase up to 3% of our common shares outstanding, giving us yet another lever to manage our capital levels. Moving on to slide 13, Net interest income was up 1% year over year, or up 4%, excluding the impact of lower fixed income trading revenue, which was impacted by lower spreads on repo balances. Strong volume growth, more than offset, continued margin headwinds, driving solid net interest income growth in both Canadian banking and city national. Turning to slide 14. At the segment level, we had outsized NIM compression in our largest banking franchises. Canadian banking NIM decreased nine basis points sequentially, partly due to an accounting adjustment of two basis points, or 22 million, which we do not expect to repeat going forward. Another two basis points was due to lower mortgage prepayment revenue, a reversal of favorable trends we noted on our Q2 earnings call. The three basis point impact from lower asset spreads is largely related to strong mortgage origination as the benefit from sequential credit card growth was offset by growth in lower spread mortgage loans. City National NIM was down 20 basis points sequentially with 11 basis points related to lower loan fees, largely from the forgiveness of the first round of triple T loans. Another seven basis points 
was due to lower loan-to-deposit ratio trends as deposit growth continued to outpace strong loan growth. Going forward, we expect both Canadian banking and city national margins to stabilize around current levels with a bias to the upside as central banks raise interest rates. While city national's interest rate sensitivity is largely driven by an increase in short-term rates, Canadian banking would benefit more from a broader across-the-curve increase. We estimate that a 25 basis point increase in interest rates across the curve could result in over $250 million of additional revenue over 12 months across Canadian banking and U.S. wealth management inclusive of sweep deposits. We expect the benefit from a rate hike in the second and third years would be higher than seen in the first year. Turning to slide 15, non-interest income was up 20% year over year. We continue to see strong growth in higher ROE investment management and mutual fund revenue in wealth management and Canadian banking. Strong M&A deal flow and loan syndication activity were reflected in higher advisory and credit fees as we execute on our capital markets client-centric growth strategies. Higher card service revenue in Canadian banking reflected Canadians' increased spending on travel and entertainment heading into the holiday season. As we continue to enhance our rewards programs and drive higher client engagement through increased options to earn and redeem points, we adjusted our rewards liability by $29 million this quarter. Offsetting this was an expected moderation in global markets revenue, which I'll provide more details on shortly. Turning to expenses on slide 16, non-interest expenses were up 9% year over year. A legal provision of $116 million in city national impacted expense growth by approximately two percentage points. Adjusting for this provision and excluding higher variable and share-based compensation across our businesses, expense growth was 2% year over year. As quarterly capital markets compensation ratio typically experiences volatility in the fourth quarter, it's important to look at full year trends. And the 2021 annual ratio of 35% is consistent with 2020 levels. Salaries and benefit costs were up 4% from last year as we continue to add employees in Canadian banking and city national to support increasing client activity. Marketing costs were also higher as the economy opened up and we increasingly engaged with new and existing clients across our businesses. However, there is also an element of seasonality in the quarter over quarter increase of certain line items. Looking forward to 2022, we expect marketing costs to trend higher than pre-pandemic levels as we execute on our strategic growth initiatives. However, corporate travel costs are expected to remain below pre-pandemic levels in the near term. Overall, we expect annual expenses, excluding variable and share-based compensation, to grow at the higher end of the low single digits range as inflationary pressures and higher investments to support growth initiatives are expected to be offset by our continued focus on driving efficiencies and productivity gains. Moving to our business segment performance beginning on slide 17. Personal and commercial banking reported earnings of $2 billion this quarter, including the benefit of lower PCL. Canadian banking pre-provision, pre-tax earnings were up a strong 8% from last year as solid revenue growth was supported by strong operating leverage. Looking forward, we expect annual operating leverage to be closer to the high end of our historical 1% to 2% guidance with the potential to be above that range as central banks raise interest rates. Canadian banking revenue was up 6% year over year with net interest income up 2% from last year. On a sequential basis, an uptick in commercial loan growth added to continued strength in mortgages. Growth in credit card balances was largely related to higher purchase volumes with payment rates remaining elevated relative to pre-pandemic levels. Non-interest income was up 15%, largely due to higher mutual fund distribution revenue underpinned by higher AUA, including record net sales, as client liquidity continued to move into investment products. 
card service revenue was up on higher purchase volumes. Turning to slide 18, wealth management reported fourth quarter earnings of $558 million, driven by strong investment management and mutual fund revenue growth and robust volume growth at City National. These were only partly offset by a commensurate increase in variable compensation, higher non-compensation costs, and a legal provision and lower spreads at City National. Double-digit client asset growth across our North American wealth businesses benefited from both higher markets with strong North American equity markets more than offsetting weakness in bond indices, as well as strong net sales. RBC GAM attracted total net sales of over $12 billion in the quarter, with strong institutional flows adding to continued momentum in Canadian long-term retail net sales, which added $4 billion to AUM. The majority of Canadian retail flows went into balance mandates. Turning to insurance on slide 19, net income of $267 million increased 5% from a year ago, primarily due to favorable annual actuarial assumption updates, partially offset by lower favorable investment-related experience, including the impact of realized investment gains in the prior year. Insurance revenue benefited from higher group annuity sales and growth in longevity, reinsurance, and Canadian insurance sales. Looking at INTS on slide 20, net income of 109 million increased 20% from a year ago, primarily driven by higher revenues from our asset services business. Funding and liquidity revenue was also higher year over year, as the prior year reflected heightened impacts from elevated enterprise liquidity. Turning to slide 21, Capital Markets reported earnings of $920 million, up 10% from last year. Pre-provision, pre-tax earnings surpassed $1 billion for the eighth quarter in a row. Corporate and investment banking reported strong investment banking revenue as our platform, platform performed very well in an environment of robust deal flow and elevated sponsor activity. In contrast, global markets moderated from elevated levels last year. FIC revenues were down 14% year-over-year, reflecting similar trends across the industry. Lower spreads continue to impact repo and secured financing revenue, which was down 18% year-over-year. Equities revenues were down 17% as volatility levels normalized closer to pre-pandemic levels. To conclude, we continue to drive strong growth in volumes and client assets and are well positioned to benefit from higher interest rates. And while we look to accelerate our growth momentum, we remain focused on expense management and effectively deploying capital to continue delivering value for our shareholders. With that, I'll turn it over to Graham. Great, and thank you, Nadine, and uh, good morning to everyone. So starting on slide 23, allowance for credit losses on loans of 4.4 billion is down 1.7 billion from its peak in Q4 of last year reflecting the ongoing improvements in our macroeconomic outlook and the credit quality of our portfolio that Dave noted earlier. In 2021, we released over 50% of the pandemic-related reserves on performing loans built in 2020. The releases this quarter were primarily in our commercial, personal lending, and cards portfolios in Canadian banking, reflecting further improvements in our macroeconomic outlook and the credit quality of those specific portfolios. Allowances for these portfolios do remain above pre-pandemic levels, giving ongoing headwinds that I will touch on later in my remarks. Turning to slide 24, our gross impaired loans of $2.3 billion were down $253 million, or four basis points, during the quarter. Impaired loan balances decreased across all our major businesses, and new formations of $298 million remained close to the nine-year low set last quarter. In Canadian banking, we had modest increases in new formations during the quarter, with increases in the unsecured personal lending and small business portfolios. In capital markets, new formations were limited to just $7 million as clients continued to benefit from favourable market conditions. Turning to slide 25, PCL and impaired loans of $137 million, or 7 basis points, was down by 1 basis point and declined for a sixth consecutive quarter. The low level of provision throughout 2021 reflect the quality of our client base, our prudent underwriting practices, the economic recovery underway, and the impact of government support programs on delinquencies and impairments. 
In the Canadian banking retail portfolio, <clears throat> TCL and impaired loans is down 12 million quarter over quarter, due primarily to lower write-offs on credit cards. During the year, the retail portfolio has benefited from higher client deposit levels, decreasing unemployment rates and ongoing government support programs. For context, this quarter, approximately 6% of our retail lending clients were still receiving government support, down over 60% from the peak observed in 2020. In the Canadian Banking Commercial Portfolio, TCL and impaired loans was down 3 million quarter over quarter. Provisions taken this quarter continue to be primarily in sectors impacted by COVID-19. However, the portfolio overall continues to see low and stable delinquency rates, net credit upgrades, and reductions in credit watch list exposure. In capital markets, we had a net recovery on impaired loans for the third consecutive quarter. This portfolio is not materially impacted by government support programs and has benefited from a constructive operating environment and strong market liquidity. And finally, in wealth management, PCL and impaired loans increased 14 million quarter over quarter. During the quarter, we took additional provisions on a loan written off in the information technology sector at City National. Overall, we continue to be pleased with the positive trends in our loan portfolio, supported by favorable market conditions. While many individuals and businesses have weathered the worst of the pandemic, a number of headwinds remain, as Dave noted. Rising and persistent COVID-19 cases and the prospect of new variants create the potential for continuation or resumption of COVID-19 related containment measures. Inflationary pressure pressures may also impact our clients through increasing costs driven by supply chain disruptions and labor shortages and through increased increases in interest rates. We have incorporated many of these risks into our provisioning scenarios, which leaves us comfortable with our current levels of allowances. Looking forward, we do expect our PCL ratio and impaired loans to trend back toward long-term averages over time. In addition to the headwinds I've already noted, the wind down of government support now underway will also impact both our commercial and retail clients. So the full impact will take time to materialize due to the strong levels of liquidity, savings, and job demand currently in place. Additionally, we have seen strong recoveries on impaired loans over the past few quarters, which we do not expect to persist given the low levels of impaired loans now remaining. That said, as I noted for a number of quarters, we expect to be able to draw down on the existing allowance on performing loans, such that our total PCL across all stages will remain below long-term averages. Importantly, we remain steadfast in our commitment to supporting our clients and delivering advice, products, and insight to help them navigate the evolving macroeconomic and operating environment. With that, operator, let's open the lines for Q&A. Hello, Discover here to explain our cash back match. Here's how it works. We give you cash back for using your Discover card on the things you were going to buy anyway. Then we match that cash back in your first year. And that's why we call it cash back match. Now to recap and say cash back one more time. We match all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year automatically. Discover, exceptionally common sense. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Limitations apply. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection? It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now get any breakfast sandwich for just 2 bucks. Available only through the app. Mobile order and pay available at participating McDonald's. McD app download and registration required. Thank you. We will now take questions from the telephone lines. If you have a question and you are using a speakerphone, please lift your handset before making your selection. If you have a question, please press star 1 on your device's keypad. You may cancel your question at any time by pressing star 2. Please press star 1 at this time if you have a question. There will be a brief pause while participants register for questions. We thank you for your patience. Our first question is from John Aiken from Barclays. Please go ahead. Good morning. Wanted to start off on on capital markets, um, Derek. We saw you know an exceptionally strong year, but as the second half evolved, we saw revenues um, trailing off a little bit, and the the revenues in the quarter were one of the lowest over the last uh, last eight quarters. Was there anything in the quarter you'd highlight as unusual, either positive or negative, and is this a run rate you're looking for in terms of 2022, or can we get the revenues a little bit higher uh, from here? Uh, sure. Thank you uh, for the question. I think um, you know I'll, I'll address it in two parts. First, 
Looking at Q4, I think overall it was it was uh, we feel it was quite a solid quarter. Um, as Nadine reviewed, we had very strong activity on the investment banking side, uh, both in M and A and in loan syndications, and we see that level of activity continuing. And our pipeline heading into next year continues to feel very healthy. Obviously, the one area where we saw uh, a slowdown in revenue was in the markets business, and I would say that you know there were a couple of things driving that. Uh, one is just the ongoing normalization we've seen in client activity and, and volatility that we saw in markets in Q4. Now, that's obviously picked up as we've uh, come into the fall again, but it was a little uh, more tepid as we went through the summer. Second, uh, when you're comparing over the last eight quarters, uh, recall obviously Q4 tends to be seasonally slower just given uh, August and the summertime lull in activity that we tend to see. So we certainly would not look at Q4 as indicative of where we see normalized quarters going. Uh, you know, I think the third item I would say is, uh, you know, we were quite careful managing risk coming into the fall. Uh, it was uncertain on what COVID and dynamics would bring as, uh, you know, kids returned to school and communities continued to reopen. Uh, so I think we, we came in with a cautious risk mindset, and you saw that in some of our you know, bar metrics and no trading losses in the quarter. Uh, you know, obviously uh, the return uh, in the fall turned out to be pretty smooth and market stayed very, very robust. And so, you know, in hindsight, were we uh, a little cautious on risk? Possible, but I think it was probably a prudent way to approach it given what we were facing at the time. Um, if I then turn to the outlook going forward, um, you know, we do, as we've communicated, see normalization in markets, but we think that our run rate will settle above pre-pandemic levels. And, uh, you know, if I look at pre-tax, pre-provision earnings, pre-pandemic, we were generally running in the 800 to 850 million a quarter range. Uh, as we saw the elevated client activity throughout the pandemic, that was more in the 1.1 to 1.2 billion range. And as Nadine highlighted, we've now had eight consecutive quarters over a billion. Importantly, that does include the first quarter of 2020, which was before the impact of the pandemic, uh, which was our first quarter through that billion dollar mark. And so that is certainly a, a, an area we're focused on. And while we see things normalizing, our objective would be to try to keep that run rate above the billion dollar level in terms of pre-tax pre-provision. Great. Thanks for the color, Derek. I'll, I'll recue. Thank you. A following question is from Ibrahim Punawala from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, I guess uh, just a question, Dave. Uh, as we think about capital allocation, I think that's going to be a big deal uh, uh, in terms of just some of the decisions you will be making. Talk to us in terms of when we think about the CET1 north of 13 and a half, uh, beyond funding for organic growth, the announcements you made this morning, how do you think about inorganic growth? Uh, last quarter you talked about strategic partnerships for asset generation, um, talk, uh, would love to hear your thoughts around asset management, wealth management distribution, if, if there might be opportunities there where you could deploy some of this excess capital. Yeah, I think you covered you know, part of my answer in your question, so you're, you're, you're on all the right themes. But I think one of the things we're trying to highlight in our comments this morning is that more capital-intensive, higher return growth opportunities are starting to present themselves in credit cards and commercial lending in Canada. Certainly, our mid-market corporate strategy in the U.S., capital markets, corporate banking, we're looking to put more balance sheet out there. And I, again, as you said, we have very strong organic capital generation ability that will fund the majority of that. But we do expect to see really good RWA growth as our clients start using uh, their balance sheet and our balance sheet to a greater degree. That's obviously the primary use is, is organic growth. Um, as far as inorganic, to your question, you're starting to see uh, a number of our ventures uh, take flight. We highlighted two more ventures to you today. Dr. Bill, uh, you know, partly through inorganic acquisition, uh, looking to build out the healthcare vertical. It's been, you know, with a partnership with the College of Physicians, it's been a, a fantastic partnership, up 28%, as you heard. So we're going to look to continue to build out that vertical. We introduced Mido today which is in you know, the family finance vertical, incredibly exciting opportunity. If you see some of the similar uh, capabilities uh, in the U.S., you know, would there be an opportunity there to kind of build out that early stage client pipeline 
and to bring clients into the organization in very different ways than we have historically. So again, as part of future proof in the organization, we are looking to make acquisitions in those verticals in addition to the uh, small business vertical that we've talked about, the mortgage vertical as we look at Ojo and building out our ability to help clients uh, find homes and, uh, and, and close homes. So all of those capabilities will present opportunities north and south of the border for us to, to grow uh, acquisitions. That will generally be fairly small, I would think. It's better to get these acquisitions early stage than pay significant goodwill in, in later stage. I think other, the few other firms that are pursuing this strategy, not that many, uh, were, were distinct in this strategy. I found similar things that you know, paying a huge premium for, for uh, you know, in mid-stage uh, is very expensive, and therefore trying to find these in earlier stages in that 20 to 150 million range. So again, it's not going to consume a lot of capital, but very important to our growth strategy. The other place we can deploy capital is we've got four major ventures that we need to scale, and we have an aggressive plan to scale nationally ventures like Owner that we've talked to you over the last couple quarters. We're very excited about our Dr. Bill. We talked about today, uh, Ojo on the home side. So again, we can deploy capital now into scaling uh, those ventures. So that's a whole growth segment that uh, we'll, we'll need and we'll see more capital as we try to really build significant momentum into, into capabilities that have proven a very strong client reaction to. So we've, we've managed these ventures, we've built them, we've tweaked them, we've pivoted to where we've found a customer market fit. And those you know, four or five that have a strong customer market fit that we keep talking about are going to get capital uh, to scale. And then it leads to your third question around uh, in our more traditional wealth management distribution. Absolutely, we're, we're, we're interested in acquiring wealth management distribution, either particularly in the United States, obviously, but in Europe as well, uh, to build out that franchise. There are, we're looking for quality pl platforms, and therefore we're, we're being prudent, and we're thinking about you know, the value and the dilution to the shareholder at the same time because we have the ability to grow these organically at the same time. So, again, it comes back to real discipline around we have to create shareholder value, and we're very conscious of the dilution. And the, the last alternative is to return capital to you, which we are starting to do, and have that ability through share buybacks and continued share buybacks. So, again, nothing strategically changing. The capital doesn't have a half-life to it. It will sit there and it gives us enormous strategic optionality. Thanks, Dave, and congrats to the Dean and the awesome on your new roles. Thank you. Our following question is from Manny Grauman from Scotiabank. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Graham, you talked about uh, normalization and PCL ratios. Uh, back to uh, where they were pre-pandemic, and I am just uh, want some clarification there in terms of the timing. Is, is this, uh, in your mind, a 2023 story where we basically get back to where we were pre-pandemic? Uh, is that the right year to think about? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think there's some hesitancy on, on timing because I think there's a high degree of uncertainty out there. Is, you know, and certainly you can just reflect on the last week and we see kind of the emergence of new uh, new variants and kind of the uncertainty associated with monetary policy to, to remind us of that. Um, you know, I'd say we are obviously an exceptionally benign credit environment and you know, it's manifested itself with incredibly low levels of loan losses. I think last quarter we were eight basis points, this quarter seven basis points. Um, so, you know, having said that, we do see that kind of trending back to more normal levels. It will happen over time. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's, uh, there's a number of factors that we look at and kind of thinking about the timing and those will hit different portfolios. Um, at varying paces. You know, some of those factors are certainly around kind of the strong asset prices and the implications that's had on recoveries. Um, on the wholesale side, you know, we've seen, I think I said, net three quarters in a row now where we've had net recoveries in capital markets. Certainly we don't see that persisting um, in the coming quarters, and so that will influence uh, our, our provisions there and kind of return us back to more normal levels over time there. Um, on the retail side, though, we've, we've benefited from strong asset prices more in the housing and auto space. Um, but those will persist for a longer period, and so that'll take time for that to kind of revert to normal, and that'll be related to kind of the portfolio turning over. Um, secondly, I think I mentioned government support. Uh, certainly, we've assumed that government support is, has, you know, had the degree of suppressing loan losses in the near term. Um, our debate has really been around, uh, you know, degree to which that is, is mitigated or, or, or simply deferred. Um, you know, as government support has been extended a few times, that's really had two implications. 
Um, the first is, you know, it's mitigated more of the losses than we originally anticipated, and so that's, you know, due to more consumers being bridged to reemployment, um, businesses being bridged to a reopening. Um, but secondly, it's also delayed the timing, and, and, and when do we think that's going to kind of start resulting in increasing loan losses? I think we're on a more definitive path now on, on the government support winding down. Certainly we're seeing that on the consumer side, and I think the small business is going to happen over the coming months. Um, so we'll be looking for signals in our portfolio on that uh, kind of side in the coming quarters, um, whether that be through kind of ratings changes or delinquencies, um, and particularly on the unsecured consumer products there. Um, and then lastly is you know, around the macroeconomic environment that we kind of we talked about. And, and uh, you know, the current economic environment is very robust and supportive of the, of the credit outcomes. And so we don't see that changing and tipping things in, in the near term. But uh, we are looking at in inflation and supply chain, and those will have impacts over time. And, and the prospect of rising rates also will factor in over time. Um, you know, so you put all those together, like things like supply chain will have more of a near-term impact on our small business and commercial portfolios. Um, whereas higher interest rates will, will take more time. It'll, it'll affect uh, you know, our real estate portfolios and pockets for our corporate portfolio. But that's unlikely to be a factor in this coming year. And so I think in 2022, we'll see it rising um, levels of, of loan loss allowances. But as I said in my, my comments, I think the total PCL there will still be well below kind of historic norms. And I think it's more into 2023 and beyond that you start to get into kind of more normalized levels. Thanks for that detail. Thank you. The following question is from Paul Olden from CIBC. Please go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. I want to ask you a broad question around uh, inflation and related risks. Now, you've already addressed um, sort of your expectation for operating expense growth, and you've talked about expectations for central bank uh, rate tightening in response to higher inflation. But I wonder if there's any kind of other impacts, whether negative or positive, that we should be thinking about in terms of uh, bank earnings in a higher inflationary uh, environment? Well, maybe I'll start and then I'll see if anyone wants to, to jump in. I think Graham put his hand up here. Um, certainly, an inflationary env environment helps our asset growth, helps the economy grow, right? So, as you, you think about uh, asset inflation, you know. Uh, if it's if it's healthy and under you know a, a normalized channel, not excessive, then you don't build a bubble, and that can be supportive of overall balance sheet growth and, and profitability growth. Uh, from that perspective, uh, where you start to worry is when you start to see excess asset growth in a certain area, and that inflationary impact is, has to be watched in a number of asset classes. Um, and then you worry about it from obviously your customers' cost management and their margins and their ability to to maintain healthy kind of debt coverage ratios. So we do worry about it from a risk perspective. Maybe Graham will, will touch on that. So there's this positive and negative, and that's why as a bank you have to watch these things carefully and on the asset and uh, CPI side and what impact they're having. And we'll get a look into that increasingly with the you know the quarterly numbers that we see from our clients and their income statements and balance sheets. So, you know, those, off the top of my head, those are two areas that, you know, we certainly talk about as a team. And Graham, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I, I think the inflationary kind of ranges we're, we're entertaining right now, I think that's a net positive for the, the bank overall. I mean, so while rising, you know, we'll see kind of enhancements and improvements to our to our revenue, those will be attended with, with higher credit costs that come with that kind of in, in relation to what I referred to earlier. And, Again, it's going to affect different portfolios in different ways. You know, you look at, uh, say, our small business and commercial clients. Um, you know, they're more price takers than price makers. They're going to have less supplier flexibility. You know, and so they're going to, you know, they're going to see a, a higher implication towards our credit costs. And that's kind of referring back to the comments I made earlier around our, our, our forecast going forward. Um, you know, this will ultimately translate into higher interest rates as well. But as I said, that's, that'll take a much longer time to really translate into our credit costs. When you look at our, our fixed rate portfolios, it's going to, you know, those late rates are locked in and it'll be when we get to those points of refinancing. And, and those are kind of more measured in years than they are in months and quarters in terms of the implications there. So different portfolios will will see that and absorb that in different ways. Um, the corporate portfolio is probably more resilient again because, again, they, they have a better ability to pass on their, their, their inflationary costs, um, more resiliency in their operations. Um, so we look at those implications in different portfolios across the board, but overall it will over time, you know, contribute to the, the rising kind of uh, loan loss costs. And then just quickly, can you tell us what your inflation range expectations are? 
Well, I, I think we have a number of scenarios that, that we analyze, and each of those scenarios is going to have slightly different assumptions embedded in it. We look at the different ranges for kind of extreme purposes and capital resiliency. So I'm not sure there's a single answer we'd give you on that, but uh, but really look do look at a wide range as, as we can think about both capital and, and earnings on that front. Okay, thanks. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. The following question is from Doug Young from Desjardins Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, good morning. Just looking at the wealth management division, I mean, pre-tax pre-provision earnings, I've got up 3% if I exclude the legal provision. It doesn't really match with what we're seeing in the asset growth. And I guess my question is, is there any other unusual items? And I guess where I'm going is, I know there's several segments in here, um, you know, Canadian asset management, wealth management, CNB. I'm just hoping you can provide maybe some perspective on what you're seeing pre-tax, pre-provision wise, because I think there's probably some good news stories on the asset management side that may be overshadowed by some just near-term pressure in CNB, uh, City National Bank. And, and I guess this isn't a, maybe a question, but a statement. It would be helpful to have City National Bank removed from the wealth division, because I do think sometimes it clouds it out. So I'm just hoping to get some color on that. Thanks, it's Nadine. I'll, I'll start and thanks for your advice on the segmentation. Appreciate that. Uh, just as it relates to the U.S., I'll start with U.S. wealth management. And you're right, there are there are a couple of elements in there. And so we we spoke about the strength on the wealth management side, particularly in Canada and the U.S. with the the high growth in the AUA. So there, obviously, with that business, you do have the variable compensation that scales with it. So very strong margin there, and we have been adding a lot of advisors in order to, to generate that growth on the AUA side. So I would say that's still a strong momentum in that business going forward from a PPPT perspective. When you look at City National, I, we spoke a bit around the margin compression that we saw, uh, but if you look at what some of the drivers were related to that, the PPP loans in particular, which we expect that to taper off. Uh, going into next year, so that will no longer be a headwind. And then as we look at the, the mix, we've seen a lot of strong asset generation, but that deposit level has still been quite high. And so that, that loan to deposit mix ratio has put some pressure on margins, but then as we start to see rates increase next year, you'll start to see that margin expansion as it relates to City National. On the cost base there, we have grown that bank a lot, and so we do have to invest in our infrastructure in order to support that. That's why you're seeing a bit more of the uptick uh, in costs as it relates to the city national platform outside of the provision. I would say going forward though, given the expectation around some of those changes as it relates to the stabilization of the NIM, uh, that we do expect uh, you know, strong operating leverage overall in that business segment. Maybe I'll turn it over to Doug if you want to speak about the... Uh, yeah, sure. I think, I think the hypothesis in the question is, is a very good one. So if you looked at the core Canadian larger franchises of Global Asset Management and, um, and Wealth Management Canada, a couple of things that are probably not obvious. So there, there are some compensation true-ups in the quarter. Uh, that's a good news uh, fact and that, that uh, while we didn't get the accruals right throughout the year, those are performance-based or, or, or profitability-based compensation programs. So that's not a normalized um, run rate. There's seed capital that quarter over quarter was a little bit lower than the prior, cap, prior quarter, but, but they're again not fundamental to the, to the um, the, the success of the business. So, you know, you're right. The, 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 the big franchises that drive the bulk of the earnings in the non-U.S. part of the segment are, are very healthy and, and fundamentally very strong. Great. Thank you. Thank you. A following question is from Gabrielle Deschain from Mon uh, National Bank Financial. Please go ahead. Uh, good uh, morning. Um, just a follow-up for Derek on the capital markets outlook. Um, you know, I, I get some of the indications there, but do you think earnings growth and PTPP growth in your segment can be positive in the coming year? And then a separate question, Dave, Nadine. Uh, well, Dave, in your opening remarks, you talked about paying $6 billion of taxes in this past fiscal year. <clears throat> Makes me think about the uh, liberal... Uh, uh, proposal to introduce the surtax on on you know banks in uh, on their Canadian earnings presumably. Have you done any work to uh, quantify the impact of that uh, proposal? Thanks. So I'll let Derek go first, and I'll I'll follow on with the tax question. Sure. Um, you know, good 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 question. Not an easy one to answer in terms of uh, you know the the 
outlook on client activity. I guess the way I would approach it is, you know, obviously 2020 was a very strong year for us given elevated client activity and coming into 2021, uh, we had expected there'd be some normalization of that activity. Uh, it probably didn't normalize as, as much as we feared. And so we had to construct the backdrop for this year. And you saw that result in, uh, you know, 3% growth in revenue and 5% growth in pre-tax pre-provision for 2021 off of what was, you know, a prior high watermark in 2020. So notwithstanding, um, you know, some expectation of normalization, we did manage to drive strong uh, revenue, pre-tax, pre-provision growth, and then obviously very strong NIAD on the back of the PCL recovery. So I think as we now look forward to 2022, it's a little bit of a similar situation. Uh, client activity on both the investment banking, corporate banking side, as well as in markets, still continues to be very healthy. We see that continuing right now, and against that backdrop, you know, I think we feel quite good about our pipeline and level of activity, but what's obviously difficult to predict is, you know, particularly building off of some of Graham's points as we see dynamics around variants and changes in monetary policy and inflationary pressures and how policymakers may react to that, you know, it's difficult to predict what the capital markets environment will look like for the full year. So, you know, certainly our, our objective is to continue to drive growth, but it will be somewhat dependent on the market backdrop and level of client volumes. Well, are expenses a lever, though, because, well, uh, that you can't pull because you would have, I mean, a lot of investment banks would have expanded uh, staffing levels in the past year or two? Yeah, no, certainly, you know, cer certainly costs is something we'll continue to keep a close eye on. And, you know, a large component of our costs are compensation, which are linked to performance of the business. So that does give us a natural lever that if for some reason activity slows and, and revenue slows, there will be you know, uh, an offset in compensation expenses. You know, more broadly, we are still very focused on broader productivity and efficiency initiatives. And, you know, two items that we do feel very good about exiting this year, we did manage to bring our, uh, even though we had great results in 2020, we managed to bring our efficiency ratio down by almost another 100 basis points this year and continue to drive positive operating leverage in 2021. And so, you know, uh, obviously our clear objective is to drive the client volumes, but we will manage our NIE closely to try to ensure we continue to drive strong productivity and, and positive operating leverage. Thank you. And maybe a, a quick uh, high-level comment on the overall uh, bank tax environment. You know, I, I think from, from a macro perspective, the most important thing that we have to think about as a country is we need to attract capital. We need to attract capital domestically, and we need to attract capital from foreign direct investment. We're going through an enormous transition of our economy, supply chain transition, uh, climate transition journey, where we're going to need up to $2 trillion, and therefore creating an environment that attracts capital, and, and where the rules around the economics are, are certain for a longer period of time is really important. And I think when you start proposing taxes right now it is, in, in this narrow way, can be can have a real detriment to the overall investment thesis for Canada. So for the first reason there, we're obviously uh, articulating that perspective that's really important for Canada to think about long-term investment uh, in our country. And the second is, you know, a, a tax on banks, uh, a unique tax like that, has, means less capital for small business, less capital for investment in our clients. As you know, we retain roughly 45% we pay out 45% of our income and we reinvest the other 55% mostly in this country and in, in North America and North American supply chain. Therefore, that just means less capital to reinvest. So I think from those perspectives, now is not the time to, to, to look at these types of policies. We need to rein in our spending. We need to think about inflation and we need to make sure we attract the future generation of supply chain and manufacturing and investment and climate to this country. I, I hear you, but uh, and I tend to agree with everything you say. But you know, there may actually be a tax that's imposed nonetheless. Is there a view evaluated? The I answer? don't have any details on it. Right. Yeah, I would. I would just say that there, we're still working out some of the details. There's nothing been announced as yet, so right. it's a little difficult for us to comment on a, on an impact until we get more information on it. Understood. Thanks. Thank you. A following question is from Mario Mendonca from TD Securities. Please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, Graham, can we go back to a comment I believe you made in Q3 21? Um, I think you, you suggested that 
PCLs, the impaired loan PCLs ratio in 2022 might in fact be higher than the long-term averages. And I think a few of us observed that that seemed a little bit uh, high. Um, and I, again, I'm getting the sense from this call that you're now suggesting that it might be below long-term averages. First of all, have I, have I characterized that correctly? And secondly, can you talk about that change? The fact that I characterized it properly. Um, yeah, thanks, Mario. Sorry, and I think we go back. I think when we were making those comments, we were referencing to at, at, at peak points, i.e., in a certain quarter, not certainly on an annual aggregate, right? And and, and so, so there's a part of the context is that. Um, and I think then that kind of leads into this quarter and my my earlier comments, right? Which I said I think as we've gotten further into the recovery, um, as we've seen that government support continue to extend. Um, as we've seen more clients bridge to kind of reemployment and, and bridge the reopening of the economy, again, those all factor into our, our comfort and confidence that, that more of those loan losses that, that we think had been suppressed have actually you know, hopefully been mitigated and not just simply deferred to a later date. Um, you know, again, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, and so as my, to my comments earlier, the timing on, on kind of when we kind of get back to those, those uh, more normalized levels is, is still uncertain. Um, and it's going to vary by portfolio. And I kind of went through the factors as to how, you know, the retail for portfolios will be impacted by different factors in some of our wholesale portfolios. That some of these effects will take longer to kick in, such as rising interest rates. Um, but, but that's just to give you a little bit more color, I, I think, on uh, kind of how we're thinking about it in our commentary now this quarter versus in the comments we provided last quarter. So to make sure I understand the comments you're providing this quarter, then, you, you're suggesting that, uh, in 2022, the impaired loan ratio will probably be a little lower than what we've seen in prior years or, or long-term averages, and that perhaps by 2023 it starts to normalize. Is that uh, – have I characterized you correctly there? I, I think that's roughly fair. And, again, it's just the timing of when we get that peak is, is, is part of the question mark there. Okay. Uh, Nadine, can we go to um, an expense-type question? I'm looking at the measure that Royal likes to use, uh, and it makes sense, the one where you look at your year-over-year -year expense growth, excluding variable comp and stock compensation. And uh, that number had been declining fairly consistently year-over-year -year for some time now. And I imagine some of that was COVID-related. And then this quarter, of course, it, it sort of moves um, higher, and materially so. Can you talk about what was it about this quarter that caused that measure to really reverse course? It had been trending down and then it really reverses course specifically in Q4. Can you speak to that? Sure, thank you, Mario. In terms of a couple of things I would comment on, we mentioned in, in my remarks around the marketing costs, and part of that would be seasonal, but part of that also is just from a Canadian banking perspective, really starting to ramp up on our marketing as you would have seen probably through the uh, summer and into the fall. In addition to that, uh, we have seen, you know, we have been increasing our, our headcount overall, and as that starts to uh, pull through in terms of a run rate. So that is something that as we talk about the growth we've been generating around our strong volume, that was a bit of an inflation pressure, but going forward, uh, we look to see that we will have continued growth in, on the top line in order to support that increase in staff costs. Uh, in terms of technology as well, this is one area that we continue to invest. We've been investing through the pandemic. I would say that what we're focusing on going forward, really around those optimization and productivity and efficiency gains that I spoke to, is how can we continue to make sure that we're finding opportunities to invest uh, in, in, our, in our big franchises going forward and create that capacity uh, with, with reductions in other areas that we can find some efficiency and productivity gains. So a bit of it, Mario, just in terms of some of it with seasona seasonality, um, but, it, but also we are, we are seeing that just some of the uh, increase as it relates to some of our growth initiatives. Uh, but, you know, as I mentioned, with our, our low single-digit guidance, uh, still we're looking to advance that into next year. For next year, maybe you may have answered that, and I may have missed it. Yeah, sorry, our guidance is still in low single digits, with, with, with potential with the inflation pressures moving it up a bit on the low single side. But positive operating leverage, is that fair? Correct, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The following question is from Sorab Movahedi from BMO. Please go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate we've gone over the hours, so I appreciate you taking the call. Uh, maybe just can I start there, Nadine, for a second? So call it around 4%, let's just say. 
expense growth, including inflation. You, you've talked about the positive operating leverage, and a number of times I think you made reference to higher rates. Can you can you tell us what uh, is assumed in your budgeting process as far as rates increases next year? Sure thing. So, so we've looked at it. Um, we would have done it earlier in the fall. Would would include probably two rates in Canada, which would have been uh, probably mid year and then towards the end of the year. Uh, and in the U.S., we didn't anticipate any any rate hikes. So just so that would be the basis of the assumption when you're talking about positive operating leverage, for example, as as far as the impact on your margins and spreads are concerned. Correct. Okay. And then if I can just clarify one thing with uh, with Neil. Neil, mortgage growth, can you talk to us a little bit about what mortgage spreads were like during the quarter, maybe throughout the quarter compared to prior periods? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, you probably have a sense. I mean, you know, exceptionally strong uh, volume across the industry. Um, you know, the record amount of originations in our business. Um, and with that really strong market and all that demand, you know, increased price pressure from competition. So it's been a very tight market. Um, I think we've talked in the past. Um, you know, we haven't led on price. Uh, we just basically have a strategy. We know we have to be competitive uh, and make sure we're providing good value for our clients. But without a doubt, it um, there's been price pressure in the mortgage business. And can you can you quantify some of that for us? Like, you know, how how were spreads this quarter versus prior quarters, or or, or any any point of reference? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, in terms of overall in the portfolio, we've seen them come off a little bit, but they do bleed in over time. So as originations in uh, Q4, they were I'd say the tightest we saw all year. But in terms of the total portfolio, that's one quarter's worth of originations, and it will you know, bleed into the portfolio and impact the entire of the book over time. Okay, I appreciate that. And can I, if I can just have one last question. If I look historically at the total bank level, uh, your RWA growth has been, call it mid single digit, sometimes 6%, sometimes 3%, but let's call it in that 4 to 5%. This year was obviously uh, on a full year basis lower, although you had some growth um, uh, in the fourth quarter. If I think about next year, are you? Can you give us any guidance as to how you expect, you know, given the business plans that you have, how that RWA is going to trend? Is it going to revert back to that mid single digit, or is, could there be a year of catch up where it could be more like 10%, given that it, you hardly had any growth this year? I, yeah, I think it would it would revert back to higher than average, Saurabh. I mean, I think we also had the benefit this year of some of the parameter changes, particularly around the capital markets business, which would have muted some of the, the growth trajectory. But I think as Dave mentioned, the, the growth potential in our commercial loan book as, as well as in City National uh, has the opportunity for that to be maybe higher than the, the regular previous run rate we saw this year. Thank you very much. Appreciate you taking the calls. Yeah, we're going to stay on a bit longer because I think we have a couple more people in the queue and three more. So we're going to keep going. If, so stay with Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. A following question is from Scott Chen from Canaccord Genuity. Please go ahead. All right. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, maybe a bigger picture outlook. Um, we kind of think about the can Canada and the U.S. and uh, your PNC franchises, uh, U.S. being uh, City National. Where do you think the better region is uh, in terms of the outlook over the next few years and, and potentially related to P2P growth would be helpful. Thanks. Well, better. I mean, still, you know, Canada is 70% of our earnings, so it's important that Canada delivers for us uh, you know, strong growth. So it's hard to say better. But I would say, you know, when I look at the City National U.S. Wealth franchise, we had, you know, in the first kind of four or five years of City National, we had a great run. Uh, higher rates helped us. We've tripled the size of that bank. We've seen more muted growth in the last, as you've noticed, in the last you know, four to six quarters because we're replatforming City National for the next phase of growth. We've, we've tripled that bank to an $80 billion balance sheet right now. And for us to continue to, to grow at rates well above the industry, we need to replatform from a customer perspective and from an operational efficiency perspective. So I am very excited about the, the U.S. growth opportunity from a PPPT because of the higher rates that Nadine referenced, which have a significant impact on us. You just can't underestimate how asset-sensitive this 
this bank is, but also from a greater efficiency perspective. As we replatform City National, we're looking for greater efficiency, and we've grown this bank on the top of a $20 billion bank platform, and now as we replatform this thing into an 82 plus, you know, $150 billion bank, it's going to have to be you know, grow more efficiently and more effectively. So I'm, I'm very excited about the dual opportunity of revenue growth and better bottom line growth there. At the same time, when you look at ventures starting to kick in, you look at the momentum we have in our Canadian banking franchise, the, you know, the, the good, you look at our quarter over quarter growth is still very strong. We're exiting the year with really good volume growth and momentum across capital markets, as you heard Derek say, in Neil's business, across mortgages, credit cards, commercial lending starting to pick up. So you look at the quarter over quarter momentum into 2022, and then the, the flows that we're seeing in AUM and AUA in the Canadian wealth franchise, I'm very excited about Canada. And the numbers kind of speak to that as we accelerate the, the exit the year with, with very good momentum. So I don't have a favorite child, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> I like them both equally, and they both have great opportunities, which you can see in our, in our exit numbers. And I would say, yes, we are somewhat disappointed, like some may be, in how much we're able to drive to the bottom line. This quarter, we had a number of puts and takes. You saw margins came off. Uh, but that doesn't take away from the momentum that we're going into, the cost control that we'll be able to demonstrate, the stabilized margins, and therefore the op lev into the next year. Uh, in, in both markets, I think we're, we're feeling, we're feeling while well, we're not as happy with the bottom line this quarter, we're happy with the momentum and the overall franchise core. And Dave, you talked about stabilized margins. Um, uh, when do you think that will happen? It seems that that theme of quarter over quarter stabilization really, you know, really hasn't come in your quarter over quarter uh, decline was probably a bit more than expectations. Yes, and on our forecast too. So yes, we do feel good about it. Nadine's going to jump in on kind of the, you know, why we're, we're, we're more confident of the stabilization time frame. Yeah, maybe I'll just speak first to, to Canada to give you some perspective. So in, in terms of, you're right, we saw the decrease this quarter. There were a few one-offs, I would say, that we, we, we highlighted. But if we look at what's been happening with some of the rate increase that we've seen, in particular for Canadian banking, it's prominent in the long end. We look at the two- and, and five-year rates. We see that that will start to price through. That takes a bit of time in terms of how it averages in for against our deposit book. And then as we also start to see some of the expansion into some of the commercial mortgage or as we start to see the revolve rates pick up uh, in the credit card book, that will be positive. When I say stabilize, it's thinking about some of the, some of the headwinds that we've seen uh, that relates to uh, the, the mix around the mortgage book and at a lower spread, as well as some of the tailwinds we saw this year on the mortgage prepayment. So as those rates start to rise, uh, you will see less of that revenue coming through from prepayments. That's where the stabilization really comes in. So the, the benefits will have some of those one-time items are, are going to come back. And then in addition, as rates start to price through, that's when you're going to see the lift. All right. Thanks for your time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. A, a following question is from Lamar Bursault from Cormac Securities. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. So, uh, Graham, this one's probably for you. I'm wondering if we could go to slide 23 and talk about the outlook for the ACL rate. So, at the end of 2020, 53 basis points, and now you're you're sitting at 60 basis points. So, would it be fair to suggest that releases moving forward will normalize a big way heading into 2022, or is the bank comfortable letting that that uh, ratio trend below uh, 53 basis points? Any comments there would be helpful. Yeah, sure. I mean, so, I mean, there is no, I don't think there's such thing as a steady state in your, your performing ACL. The ACL is meant to be a reflection of kind of the macroeconomic forecast that you have at any given point in time and the uncertainty around that, right? And, and so those are the two factors that, that always go into it that we have to reassess each and every quarter. Um, so, you know, to put a forecast out there on a forecast is, is, a, is a bit of a difficult exercise right now. You know, I think as we look out over 2022 that, uh, you know, assuming that we continue to progress through the, the macroeconomic kind of strength we see right now, assuming we see some of this uncertainty come down, that, yeah, we would see that potentially drawing down further. Um, but the reason it's still at the levels it is, you know, we're in a macroeconomic environment that's really strong right now that would indicate that we should be at, at lower levels of ACL, but there is a high degree of uncertainty still in this environment. And that is, you know, those are some of the factors I referenced earlier. Um, so, 
know, as we progressed here, we've gotten more confident in, in bringing some of the reserves down from prior years. Um, but I wouldn't say there is a, a steady state there, but certainly as we look forward into 2022 and if we continue to progress um, as we expect and some of the uncertainty kind of, um, you know, reduces around us, that, yeah, we would expect that that can come down further. So is, uh, is the 53 basis point uh, not appropriate to use as, as the, the low end of what that could go down to? Like it could go down lower than, than 53? Again, there's no, there's no steady state there, and it's going to really be dependent on the environment we're in at any given quarter. Okay, I can thank you. give you a fixed number that we, we kind of we end up at any given time. Okay, we'll okay. move on to our last question. Rafa. Thank you. Our last question is from Nigel D'Souza from Veritas Investment Research. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to circle back on an earlier comment. You mentioned that you uh, have conducted testing for the impact of higher rates on uh, potential credit risk, and I was wondering if you could flesh that out and give us some color on the type of scenarios you were testing for, the, the timing and pace of uh, interest rate increases, and how you thought about that uh, impact in, rel in relation to credit experience. Yeah, as I said, so... So we do a lot of different scenario analysis and stress testing for different purposes, right? I mean, and so, you know, at, at the most granular level, we do that as part of our origination practices when we're originating a new residential mortgage or we're originating a commercial mortgage. Um, some of that's quite prescriptive in the residential mortgage space where B20, you know, has us uh, looking at uh, clients' capacity to service debt, you know, for an, a plus 200 basis point increase in interest rates, similar in the commercial real estate side. But then certainly we also then obviously do this much more at the portfolio level. And so whether it's our, you know, determining our, our loan loss provisions and our ACL, um, again, we don't have a single scenario there. We, we have certainly a baseline exercise, and Nadine referenced some of the assumptions there that go into our, our baseline. But then we look at a range of, I think we involve about five different scenarios that we, we look at that, that kind of describe different interest rate environments, um, some more moderate increases, some more severe, um, likewise. And then we also contemplate, you know, much more implausible environments that really go into our, our stress testing pro uh, program where we're really kind of making sure we continue to have the right level of capital adequacy um, in place, uh, you know, and, and we do those exercises across the bank. We do those in conjunction with our regulators as well. So, again, similar to the earlier comments on inflation, there isn't a kind of a fixed single scenario um, that, that we kind of lock in on, um, but we look at a, a range, we weight those, uh, those different ranges appropriately, and then that all factors into how we determine the ACL as an example that we do. Okay, that's helpful. And if I could just wrap up on uh, a comment earlier on inflation. I think you mentioned when you look at asset growth, you want to look at healthy asset price appreciation versus excess asset price appreciation. So could you provide some context on how you look at, you know, the recent price appreciation for Canadian real estate? Is that one where you view it as excessive and, and there's concern for broader economic or, or credit risk implications? How do, you, how do you think about it? Yeah, thanks for the question, Neil. I'll start just in terms of what we see in terms of housing uh, as we move on to the market um, in relation to the mortgage book. And, I mean, I think you've seen it over time. Um, obviously, the biggest driver of uh, what we're seeing in terms of HPI in, in some of the biggest markets, Toronto, Vancouver, uh, and more lately markets like Ottawa, uh, really moving up into strong double digits. You know, rates is the biggest factor. So affordability um, and um, consumers being able to just go through the metrics that Graham laid out um, and carry and carry those payments. That's the biggest driver. Um, I think, you know, in terms of on the go forward view, um, we would say immigration has been, you know, almost completely turned off. That's a demand that we haven't seen in the housing market. We would expect that to provide some offsetting demand as we expect to see the rates come up on the timing that Nadine laid out. So I think those are the factors. If we look at over time where we've seen different levers pulled, um, for example, on the regulatory front, whether it's in uh, British Columbia or Toronto, we have seen, let's say, sort of moderate corrections in those markets. And then subsequently over, let's say, the next 18 months, you know, those home prices have come back. So, uh, you know, I think those are the factors we would look at. Um, I think Graham laid out fairly well in terms of, um, you know, the confidence we have in the underwriting and the stress testing we do to make sure that whether it's on an LTV or whether it's just in terms of uh, a repricing of that debt that the consumer end or commercial customer can, can manage it. So that's, the, I think, the primary lenses we would look through um, in terms of, you know, our loan book. I don't know, Graham, do you want to add that? Yeah, I, was just, I, I think our, our risk approach to the mortgage book is to make sure we are very consistent in our approach through the cycle. So we're not using risk as a lever to drive growth here. I would just remind you know, everyone that like we have a, our focus in terms of our client base is a very high quality prime client base. We're not engaged in the subprime space. 
you know, our product set is, is again, very focused on, on first lien products, and it's very resilient. I mean, we talked about the, you know, the, the stress testing around, uh, around interest rates to make sure our clients can be resilient for a higher rate environment. We have a risk-based approach to our loan-to-value ratio. So, again, it's a very prudent approach that allows us to be consistent in our engagement with clients and manage through a cycle very effectively. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Graham. Thank you. We have no further questions registered at this time. I would now like to turn the meeting back over to Mr. Mackay. Thanks, everyone, for, for questions. We covered a lot of ground today. I think in my, my takeaways, in summary, I kind of covered a lot of it in one of the questions I took. But overall, I think the takeaways are really strong client activity and growth, market share gains across Canadian banking, Canadian wealth, capital markets, uh, city national, U.S. wealth, U.S. capital markets. Uh, you know, very strong momentum. You saw the momentum in the quarter over quarter numbers, which positions us well. And you know, our, our disappointment also is that we didn't drive as much to the bottom line as we would normally with that type of volume. We walked through kind of the margin impacts and you know, trying to price mortgages in a rising rate environment, as as was called, that was a, was a little trickier. And a number of one offs this quarter on the margin side, expenses a bit elevated, some one times in there, and therefore as we look forward our degree of control. We plan for a rate environment that, to, to a, a great question, like Sorab, uh, we plan for a rate environment that was uh, less tightening, and therefore there's upside opportunity to our own forecast. So we're, we're confident in our operating leverage going forward and, and the momentum we have in the business. So thanks for your questions, uh, all great questions, and uh, wish everyone a, a, a good holiday season and look forward to seeing you in the new year. Thanks very much. Thank you. The conference has now ended. Please disconnect your lines at this time, and we thank you for your participation. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection? It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now get any breakfast sandwich for just two bucks. Available only through the app. Mobile order and pay available at participating McDonald's. McD app download and registration required. More than one in three people will face cancer in their lifetime. Unfortunately, fear can stop you from getting your cancer screening, but it won't stop cancer. Early detection can save your life. Don't wait for symptoms to appear to act. Cancer screening is safe, effective, and accessible for everyone, including free or low-cost screening programs. Go to cancerscreeninfo.com right now for free screening resources and recommendations from the American Cancer Society. Don't wait. Early detection can save your life. Go to cancerscreeninfo.com today. Cancerscreeninfo.com. Com. Thank you for listening to TSX Quarterly. If you enjoyed the cast, remember to leave a good rating. And remember, for any additional inquiries, please consult the company's investor relations section on their website. See you next time.